Hi there, this is one of five videos on recruitment, socialisation and training of judges. And in this video, I'm going to try and give you a flavour of how judicial recruitment works in a couple of different systems. I'm going to do that by looking at career trajectories of judges on different apex courts. That's to say, that court which is at the top of the judicial system. I start with an example from England and Wales. This is a fairly typical example. Uh, it's the case of Sir Mark Waller. And I'm going to go through his, his CV, essentially pointing out some of the things that I found interesting about it. So he was born in 1940 and he went to private school. And that of itself is not remarkable for judges in England and Wales. The overwhelming majority of judges uh, did go to private school. And if there is a distinction to be made, it's between the judges who went to the top private schools, sometimes called the Clarendon group of private schools, and all the rest. So Mark Waller went to a non-Clarendon group private school, part of the rest. Um, he studied law, uh, at Durham. So in this respect, again, he might be somewhat atypical in that he didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. And having studied law, he was called to the bar in 1964 at the age of 24. So maybe he'd had a year off or something before he arrived in his main job. He practiced at the bar and then after 15 years at the bar, became Queen's Counsel. Now, Queen's Counsel marks out senior or particularly deserving counsel and probably a lower bound, a realistic lower bound on how quickly you can reach Queen's Counsel is about eight to 10 years. If you're doing it in 15 years, that's pretty good going. I mean, if you're doing it at all, that's pretty good going. Um, so that's his career as a barrister, and at a certain point in his mid-40s, he decides, well, he wants to branch out. And so he decides that he will take up a part-time role as a recorder. So these are part-time judges who uh, hear cases around the country, potentially, depends on which circuit they're assigned to. And it's often a useful staging post for individuals who want to eventually move on to the High Court. And Mark Waller was appointed to the High Court, to the Queen's Bench Division in 1989, just a, a little bit short of his 50th birthday. From the ranks of High Court judges, he was then appointed to the Court of Appeal, um, around about the time that he was a serving judge, there would have been about 100 high court judges and between 30 and 40 judges of the Court of Appeal. And again, um, you know, he's made that leap up pretty quickly, um, going to the Court of Appeal after only seven years service in the high court. He then retired upon reaching the statutory retirement age then of 70. Uh, he didn't make it to the House of Lords, which would have been the apex court at the time. There were 14 appointments to the House of Lords in the time when he was serving on the Court of Appeal. Uh, I don't know whether he applied uh, for any of those appointment exercises or whether appointment was suggested to him. But, you know, he's, he's done not too badly. He's had uh, a career after his retirement from the judiciary. He served as the Intelligence Services Commissioner, so someone who was given security clearance to look over and review the work of the intelligence services. And he did that for six years, uh, taking him up to the age of 77. And one of the things that I do like to point out when it comes to these individuals is that they do they hang about in pretty uh, elite circles. And so Mark Waller was a member of the Garrick Club. There are some atypical cases. 
Mark Waller became a judge after having practiced for a long time at the bar. If we're looking at slightly different career routes, then we do have an example of someone who was able to skip past that lengthy period serving the High Court and then Court of Appeal. We've got Jonathan Sumption, who was appointed to the Supreme Court straight from the bar. We've also got someone like Andrew Burroughs, who again was appointed to the Supreme Court without having served as a High Court or Court of Appeal judge. He was someone who rarely was appointed to the Supreme Court coming from academia. Uh, you will have noticed that those three individuals that I've described so far have all been white men. Uh, I've listed here some of the firsts, particularly firsts in terms of ethnic minority judges. So we've got Rabinder Singh, who's the first ethnic minority judge to serve on the Court of Appeal. Uh, Bobby G. McGrubb, the first Asian woman to serve on the High Court. And Akhla Chaudhary, the, the first Muslim judge to serve on the High Court. But, as I say, those are somewhat atypical cases. If we move on to uh, a different country, I've decided to describe the career of Svante Johansson, um, who is serving judge on the Högsta Domstolen, the, the Swedish Supreme Court. So he's a bit younger than uh, Mark Waller, He's a post-war generation, post-war born, born 1960 in Gothenburg. And he studied law at Lund, which, depending on who you speak to, is probably something like the Oxford or Cambridge of Sweden. And because uh, Swedish university degrees are a bit longer, slash can be taken a bit more slowly, he graduated with his degree in law at the age of 26, and what's unusual, at least for those of you who will be familiar with judicial careers in England and Wales, is that he went straight from studying law into a position as a member of the judiciary or a notari or judicial assistant. That is a kind of a lengthy traineeship and he was able to get a permanent position in the Western Sweden High Court at the age of 29, so substantially younger than some of the examples we've just discussed. Uh, from that, he was named as a, an assessor, slight promotion uh, after three years. He was then able to take some, uh, not sabbaticals, but different secondments so he worked for a period in the Justice Department as a civil servant, um, performing the kinds of things that maybe legal academics might perform in the UK as part of the Law Commission, you know, different kind of tidying up exercises, looking at the law, revising it. Um, and he was also able to fit in uh, a period as a kind of very, very senior claims adjuster uh, and an academic work on maritime and road insurance. So he had this kind of portfolio career where he was able to forge a specialization, looking at some issues relating to insurance and, and shipping law, uh, basically. Um, having pursued that twin career, he was then appointed to the House of Stolen at the age of 51 uh, in 2011, and he remains in that position as of the time of recording. If we think about some of the atypical cases, well, uh, most members of the House of the Domstolen will be like Svante Johansson in that they will have had prior judicial experience. You do have some uh, members who have come straight from private practice and some who have come straight from academia. A lot of them um, have these kind of temporary positions within the Justice Ministry, which might seem like there's a great degree of overlap between the civil service and the judiciary. But as I've already said, these positions might be regarded as functionally equivalent to working with the Law Commission. 
We move on to our third country. We're looking at one of the judges on the Tribunal Constitucional, Antonio Narvez Rodriguez. Um, he's a little bit older than Svante Hansen, uh, born in 1958. Again, studied law at university. Nothing too extraordinary there. And he's one of these people who, like Svante Hansen, moves straight from that degree in law to working in the judiciary. So he uh, participates in competitive examinations, what's called in, in lots of different uh, European countries, the concours, the concorso, uh, basically exams so that he can enter into the judicial college and start his judicial training and begin uh, that work of serving as a judge. What is slightly different about him is that he decides to go for a career in public prosecution rather than judicial work. Um, that might sound odd, but it's the Judicial College in Spain which trains both public prosecutors and judges. So he begins his prosecution career uh, still at a very early age uh, compared to, let's say, people in England and Wales who are embarking on this work. Uh, he moves up the ranks, he becomes chief prosecutor in Teruel and does that for a long, long period of time. And moves on to becoming one of the chief advocates for the government in one of the chambers of the Tribunal Constitucional, uh, dealing with those uh, matters that, that somewhat relate to uh, the criminal law and prosecution. So he has some kind of links uh, to government, but again, this is not in any way a, a partisan role. Uh, he does that for a number of years before being nominated to serve as a judge in the Tribunal. If we think uh, about some of the more atypical cases, um, then here we do perhaps have to think about judges who have slightly closer uh, links to politics. One of the interesting things about nominations to the Tribunal Constitucional is that judges are often described, at least in the press, as having a progressive or conservative leanings. Now, it's not always clear when journalists are writing this kind of stuff, you know, do they have firm evidence for that? Or are they just relying on the fact that, you know, a progressive or a conservative party nominated this person, therefore he or she must be progressive or conservative. But there are some examples of uh, politicians who've made it onto the tribunal. So I've shown here Andres Oyero, uh, a member of parliament for the Partido Popular for a long time, um, and who got onto the Tribunal Constitucional in virtue of, in part, I guess, his political service, but also kind of academic career in the law. And so certainly if we were looking at the, the Spanish case from the perspective of the UK, then the mix of prosecutors, judges and academics and some former politicians is certainly a bit more diverse. So these are three examples drawn from quite different systems and in the next video, we'll look at how these different judges are chosen and the different methods used to staff these courts.